Welcome back. In the previous week, we looked at uh, a technique of counting called uh, the principle of inclusion and exclusion. We saw several applications of this method. Now, uh, we want to look at uh, the same uh, technique maybe with a slightly different viewpoint. And the idea is to generalize this even further. So, uh, you know, before uh, going further, let us look at uh, what is called inversion formula. <clears throat> so, uh, what is an inversion formula? So, suppose uh, you are given a function g that is expressed in terms of, uh, let us say, some other function uh, f. Now, uh, an inversion formula is uh, a formula that computes uh, the function f in terms of g. So you are given a formula g in terms of f. Now uh, you want to find out what is f in terms of g. So this is an inversion formula. Right? So let us look at a very basic example to begin with. Suppose you look at the say uh, you know some uh, g of x is equal to summation i is equal to 1 to n f of i. So this is given to you. For every natural number n, you have this uh, defined. Okay? So g is defined for every natural number n, and it is summation i is equal to 1 to n f of i, where f is some function. Now the question is that can you recover f, uh, so f uh, given g, right? If you, if you know g, can you recover f? So uh, this is something uh, you must. Uh, be uh, pretty uh, convinced that you can find it very easily. To think about for, uh, think about it for a minute, uh, you can uh, see that uh, you know we can uh, write f in terms of g as follows. So f of one uh, is g of one, of course, from this summation it is very clear. Then uh, f of n can be written as g of n minus g of n minus one. Okay? This is also Something that you can verify immediately from the previous uh, definition of uh, g in terms of f. So, uh, but this is uh, slightly more than that. You know, you can if you uh, if you remember your calculus, you can see that this is a discrete analog of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Right? That is what we say in calculus. Of, right? The fundamental theorem of calculus says expresses the uh, you know one function in terms of the difference of the other at the end point. Right? So uh, one can try to prove uh, in fact the you know the non-discrete version also using uh, this kind of uh, an approach but uh, it it takes a little bit of work but it's possible I believe. Now uh, an example uh, one more example, let us look at. Suppose uh, S is a set of properties that elements of some given set, let's say A, may or uh, may not possess. Okay? So you, you have a set, a big set A of sets, several sets maybe, okay? or uh, some other elements, whatever. But now, uh, you collect some uh, properties that some of the elements of this set might have or might not have. So you take all these properties and say that okay, you know these elements have this property, these elements have this property, you know these elements have this property and that property, like whatever. So uh, you have this collection of properties that each element may or may not have. Then <clears throat> suppose uh, you know some function f counts so suppose you are given uh, given a, a subset of s let's say t then f of t counts the number of elements in a that has uh, exactly the properties that is described in t right so the properties t is a subset of s so t describes certain properties now f of t counts 
those elements that has exactly these properties and nothing else. So the other properties, this does not have, right? Only these properties it have. Precisely these properties. So whatever that number is, that is counted by tab. Now, so uh, yeah, so when I say exactly count, uh, counting exactly, I mean is that they fail to have properties in S minus T because you know S is the set of all properties that we are considering, and uh, F T counts only those precisely in T. Now, G of T, let us say, counts the number of elements in A that has at least all the properties in T, right? So G basically counts those properties where, you know, take take uh, those elements. So you take all, all those elements where these elements have all the properties in T. That is given. But it can have other properties. We don't care about that. But it should have all the properties in T. So now uh, one can immediately see that uh, G of T can be expressed in terms of f very easily, right? So you take, you know, all supersets of t, right? And then say that uh, sum over all this f, and that will give you g, right? Because f of x counts all those, uh, you know, so for, for the set x, all those having precisely the properties x, and now g of t is basically now summation over all x which is a you know superset of t f of x which means that it will have all the properties you know all the elements having properties in t and more okay. so that is what g of t is so g of t can be expressed as summation f of x where x is uh, containing t now what the uh, principle of inclusion exclusion says is that you can find the inverse that is you can express now f in terms of g also okay. so if you, if you recall the principle of inclusion exclusion you know what the way we used it and think about uh, you know exactly what we were doing that we were expressing uh, you know expressing so we wanted to find uh, some uh, you know the number of elements having precisely some property and then we said that okay we count those which has at least these many properties and then we use that to get a formula for uh, the properties that uh, is precisely in this given set right so uh, if you are not convinced go back and think about it look at some example and see whether it is precisely the same thing okay so what uh, principle of inclusion exclusion states is the following that f of t is equal to summation over all uh, uh, x containing t minus 1 raised to cardinality of x minus t g of x. Now we did not state it precisely in this form but you can see some similarity and if you if you work out the details you can uh, you can uh, verify that this indeed uh, this indeed uh, uh, expresses the principle of inclusion and exclusion okay so we will we will come back to it again but uh, for the time being uh, i want you to uh, go through this uh, you know this version uh, or this uh, point of view and then uh, uh, see whether uh, it matches with this you know this uh, expression matches with the uh, way we have defined the principle of inclusion and exclusion so uh, think about this and uh, also think about this uh, uh, way of thinking that uh, uh, you know as two functions f and g instead of the way we presented earlier okay. so and 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 you know what we are doing is actually a kind of inversion okay. so <clears throat> once you think about it it will be uh, very clear then now i want to look at this also in uh, in in a different viewpoint so you know the the classical way or or not classical not just the classical the standard way or the more popular way 
of introducing uh, principle of inclusion and exclusion is uh, by you know by looking at uh, the small examples like you know you have uh, two sets or three sets then you take uh, you know to, to count what you are doing is that okay you count the, you know count the union uh, you take the you know uh, union and then you subtract uh, you know the intersection of pairs and then you again go back and then you know uh, add the things that we have subtracted too many times right so this way uh, and then try to generalize that into a formula right? this is what we did uh, and when we try to prove uh, this from uh, you know uh, the uh, the basics and uh, the the you know i mean you know of course it is it, it is the way probably you know the uh, the technique evolved also mm. but then you know uh, this uh, technique once you see it in terms of uh, you know uh, as an inversion you know you see something more to it and then you can realize that it's actually a very minor theorem from linear algebra. So inclusion exclusion principle is just a small theorem in linear algebra. And uh, you know it, it became so uh, important because of its wide variety of uh, applications, wide applicability, right? And so let us see uh, how this is a theorem in linear algebra. So, <clears throat> so here is the theorem. Let uh, S be an n element set and uh, V be a vector space of uh, dimension 2 raised to n uh, of uh, functions that go uh, from or that maps uh, the elements of the power set of S, right, which is if S has n elements, then power set of S has 2 raised to n elements uh, to R. It's basically, it's a real valued vector space over. The power set. Now, look at uh, a linear transformation phi that maps uh, v to v uh, the following way: that phi of f of t, right? So f is already a function. Now, uh, phi of f of t is uh, summation over all uh, x containing t f of x. Okay. So this is the way uh, the linear transformation works. For uh, for any given uh, t subset of s, right? so given a t subset of s, f of t. So because you know uh, the you know the the domain of f is uh, you know the you know the subsets of uh, s. So therefore, t subset of s means that you know, the function is defined for that, and uh, therefore uh, you know uh, this is a, a, a well-defined linear transformation. Now. If, uh, if you define uh, the linear transformation this way, the theorem states that uh, its inverse exists, phi inverse, and the inverse can be given by the following. Okay? So phi inverse of f of t, again, is equal to summation over all x containing t minus 1 raised to modulus of x minus t f of x, where t is any subset of x. For every subset of s, you have this. So again, uh, you know, complete description of uh, phi inverse. So, uh, this uh, theorem is precisely what, uh, you know, the inclusion exclusion uh, principle is uh, saying. Uh, if you, you know, if you just uh, compare it with the previous statement, you can see immediately why this is the same statement. And uh, let's prove this. So, the proof is by assuming that, okay, if there is an inverse, uh, you know, uh, they said that this is the inverse. So let us take this as some function. Let's say psi. Psi max from v to v is psi of f of t is equal to summation x containing t minus 1 raised to mod x minus t f of x. So this is the definition of psi. Now we show that psi is uh, the inverse of phi by uh, multiplying them together and seeing that, you know, it returns identity, right? So let us say that what is uh, phi psi of f of t. Okay. So phi psi of f of t is uh, by uh, you know the definition the summation x containing t minus 1 raised to mod x minus t phi f of x. Now phi f of x is summation z containing x f of z. 
So therefore, uh, you get this double summation. Now, uh, you know, so you take this and then uh, you realize that, okay, so X is containing T and Z is containing X. So therefore, I can write as summation over all Z containing T. And uh, summation uh, Z containing X containing T minus 1 raised to mod X minus T. Now, this part is uh, independent of, uh, you know, the choice of uh, the Z. So therefore, I can compute it. And uh, what is that? Uh, for computing that, I put m is equal to modulus of uh, z minus t or cardinality of z minus t, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, required to, you know, write it as, you know, in, a, in the counting in a different way. So, let us look at what is the, you know, the internal bracket here, sums to. Right? So, that sums to summation uh, you know, z containing x containing t minus 1 raised to mod x minus t. Uh, so look at you know look at uh, the uh, x in terms of you know like so so it, x can vary from but t to z right so when x is equal to t you will get zero and uh, when x is equal to z we will get m right so now we count according to the cardinality of the set that we are considering. So now we can say that this is equal to or cardinality of x minus t. Then uh, we can say that this is summation i is equal to 0 to m. m choose i because precisely m choose i ways to select uh, you know an i element uh, uh, set uh, in this case and minus 1 raised to i. And uh, this is equal to what is this by using binomial theorem. One can see that uh, this will be precisely uh, 1 when m is equal to 0 only and every other case it is going to be uh, to be 0. Okay? So when m is equal to 0 this will be uh, the summation will be 1 and when uh, you know m is different from 0 the summation will be 0 because this is basically 1 minus 1 whole raised to m. So therefore uh, we get uh, this as uh, the Kronecker delta delta 0 m. Now, so the internal part is chronicle, uh, chronicle delta, delta 0 m. So now look at what happens here, right? So when, when it is precisely uh, non-zero, that is when m is equal to 0, right? So when m is equal to 0, this is non-zero. So therefore, the only term that surveys is m is equal to 0. So what is m is equal to 0? That is z is equal to t. So therefore, in the summation, the only term that remains is uh, or survives is f of t and everything else uh, disappears. Uh, and in, in, in that case, you know, the, uh, the summation here is precisely 1. So therefore, uh, we get f of t so on the right hand side. So therefore, phi uh, psi f of t is equal to f of t, which means that phi psi is the identity or, or uh, psi is the inverse of phi. So that proves the theorem, right? So it's a very simple proof. And uh, this is a result from linear algebra. And uh, you see that this statement is precisely our uh, statement of the principle of inclusion and exclusion, right? So you can express uh, f in terms of g. So, so given, uh, you know, given a function g, which is in terms of the, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, function f which counts exactly the properties in subsets uh, then you can express uh, you know f in terms of g also okay now we will take a very quick uh, review of uh, partially ordered sets uh, just uh, in case uh, some of you are not familiar with the uh, partially ordered sets or uh, not come across uh, these uh, uh, definitions and properties. So this will be very quick. Uh, we will uh, not spend too much time on this because this is just this is not part of what we uh, you know uh, are studying in this course. But you know something that is required to uh, you know to see some of the results or, or understand some of the results. Okay. 
so what is a partially ordered set so a partially ordered set p is a set uh, now the set uh, you know is also denoted a p it's an abuse of notation but uh, you know it is clear uh, from the context so therefore we don't worry about that so we will represent the same uh, uh, set which is a base uh, set and as well as the the structure uh, power set both uh, with the same letter p so the power set p is a set together with a binary relation uh, you know denoted less than or equal to in in our most cases or sometimes you can use other symbols it doesn't matter but it will be explicitly mentioned uh, uh, such that this uh, binary relation is uh, first of all reflexive that is x is less than or equal to x for every x in p right for every element it is uh, less than or equal to itself right so it, uh, it's in relation with itself so that is reflexive then uh, it's anti-symmetric which means that uh, if you know that x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to x then it implies uh, x is equal to y okay so i read it as x less than or equal to because of the symbol that we use but uh, you know uh, to be more precise you should just say that x is related to y and y is related to x but uh, you know let us not worry about that for the time and then the third condition is that it must be transitive the you know, transitive property is there that the relation x is less than or equal to y and y less than or equal to z implies x is less than or equal to z so if you have these three properties uh, for the set with this relation then we say that this is uh, a partially ordered set or it's a partial order now uh, without uh, writing it let me just mention uh, you know when the relation is strict okay, now when, when we don't allow reflexivity so the then the relation is uh, strict it's a strict partial order and we will not look at uh, strict partial order uh, in this uh, course okay so example so let us see so take the uh, you know the set of uh, integers 1 to 8 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and then i look at the uh, you know for the relation i i look at the divisibility relation okay so a divides b if b is divisible by a right uh, so this symbol is used for the uh, you know divisibility for uh, a and b in x then uh, you know x uh, with the relation uh, divisibility is a poset okay so you can see that uh, for example 2 divides 4 right uh, 3 divides 6 and 2 does not divide 5 right so 2 and 5 are not related 3 does not divide 7 uh, 1 divides 2 1 uh, 2 divides 4 and 4 divides 8 and you know by transitivity 1 divides 4, right? 2 divides 8, right? 1 divides 8, etc. Then 1 divides 5 and 1 divides 7, right? So these are, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the poset. Uh, it, you know, you can verify that, you know, reflexivity is true, that 1 is less than or equal to y, right? 1 divides y, 2 divides 2, etc. Right? Every element divides itself. And uh, anti symmetric, right? So if uh, 2 divides something and something divides 2, then uh, you know they must be the same right so that you can see right verify that any element dividing uh, another num element and uh, that dividing this it means that they must be the same element so you can verify all the three properties and then uh, uh, see that this is actually a partially ordered set now <coughs> another example this is a very important example that uh, you will come uh, to see with it many times. So X be uh, the set, uh, you know, some arbitrary set and the power set of X uh, is denoted by P of X. Now the subset relation, right? So this depends a partial order on the power set. Okay. So let us take an example. Uh, X is equal to a three element set ABC. Then, uh, you know, you know, the empty set for example is a subset so empty set uh, is uh, uh, you know it's a you know a subset of uh, for example uh, set a set b set c etc right 
Similarly, uh, A is a subset of AB. Uh, a is a subset of AC, right? B is a subset of BC. B is a subset of AC, right? So uh, all this uh, one can see, right? Now uh, I did not introduce formally what this picture means, right? So we will come to this, uh, you know, more formally later. But this is basically a kind of graph where uh, you know you represent the elements uh, of P as uh, you know as vertices of a graph, and uh, you know when uh, when you have two elements, uh, uh, you know where one is contained in the other and there is nothing in between, you put a you know line between them, and if uh, if you have an element that is a subset of or or you know less than or equal to in the relation. Then uh, you know uh, you make sure that you know the the element that is uh, the larger one, right, containing one, uh, is uh, above uh, in some sense, you know, horizontally above. So it's it's formally you know we will define a little later. Uh, but you know it's much easier to write than you know all the subsets uh, one by one. So uh, so this defines a partially ordered set. You can verify that you know the reflectivity, transitivity, and uh, uh, anti-symmetric properties uh, hold and uh, now you can generalize to uh, uh, a set with n elements and power set of x is equal having 2 raised to n elements which is denoted by 2 raised to set n uh, now the you know the usual notation that we will use for this specific power set uh, no the specific uh, partially ordered set uh, is a bn so, so BN says that you are looking at the you know two raised to n uh, uh, subsets of an n element set let's say one to n, and then uh, you are looking at the containment uh, or subset relation as the uh, as the order relation. So uh, you know this is a partially ordered set. Now uh, more uh, definitions. So when uh, when I know when I take any two elements uh, of the poset P, let's say X and Y, if X is less than or equal to Y or Y is less than or equal to X, then we say X and Y are comparable. So you know if you, if you look at the uh, this example, for, right? So for example, two and five. If you take two does not divide five and five does not divide two, so therefore two and five are not really comparable, right? So you know with with respect to the division right the relation and similarly if you take uh, a b and a c right so if you take a b and a c here right they are also not comparable you cannot say one is a subset of the other or this is a subset of that so therefore they are not comparable so <coughs> uh, when uh, you know this property holds for one of the pairs then we say that uh, uh, they are comparable now, suppose you have two possess P and Q. We say that P and Q are isomorphic. If you can find an order preserving uh, bijection, right, let us say phi, that takes uh, P to Q, whose inverse is also order preserving. So when I say order preserving, X uh, is less than or equal to Y in P, right? So this says that the relation is uh, inside P, right? So P and Q can have different uh, you know, relations. So therefore, uh, now uh, phi of x, right, is an element of Q, is less than or equal to phi of y in Q. So if this relation is if and only if, then we say this is an isomorphism. And 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 uh, uh, we also want that inverse is also order preserving. Now, right? So that's why that's why this if and only if. Now suppose you have a bijection. And uh, you know, you know that it is the bijection is order preserving. Is it necessary that the inverse is also order preserving, or can you find an example where it is not? So think about this. If you find an example, uh, let me know, or or you write it as a homework. <coughs> now, so given a poset, we can talk about a sub poset. So a subposet is a subset, of course, uh, and uh, the relation, 
right? X is less than or equal to uh, Y in uh, in Q, if and only if X is less than or equal to Y in P for X and Y in Q, right? So for all the elements in Q, right, which is the subset, this should be true, right? Then we say that it is a subposit. So there is a, you know, there is a weak uh, version of the uh, subposit definition where uh, you don't uh, insist this if and only if condition, but we will not go into that. Okay, so we will, whenever we say it's a subposit, we will say that it's a, an induced subposit or, uh, you know, the, uh, the relation uh, is maintained exactly as it is for all the elements within Q. Now, for uh, two elements X and Y, the interval X, Y is defined as the set of all elements in, in P, in the poset, such that, uh, you know, Z comes between X and Y, right? So, X is less than or equal to Z is less than or equal to Y. Okay? So, this set is always non-empty. It will contain at least X and Y, uh, or at least we want, uh, we want uh, uh, it to depend like that. Uh, and uh, so the interval uh, is uh, this set, uh, this non-empty set. Now a poset is said to be locally finite if uh, every interval uh, in P is finite. So the P itself may not be finite, but if you can say that, uh, you know, every interval is finite, right? So once you take fixed two elements, X and Y, then, uh, you know, between X and Y, the number of elements, right, that appears is finite. So then we say it is locally finite. Now, uh, when you have two elements in the power set, uh, let's say X and Y, I say that Y covers X if, uh, first of all, X strictly less than Y and there is no element Z such that X less than Z less than Y. So that, you know, so they are comparable, right, because X is less than Y, but there is no element in between, okay. So then we say that it is uh, a covering relation. So comparability should be there, but there is no element in between, right. Then we say it is, uh, it is a covering relation. So which means that X is less than Y, strictly less than Y, and uh, the interval XY is precisely the set x comma y. Now, formal definition of Hasse diagram is that it is a graph uh, on the vertex set uh, uh, as the elements of P, right, with the you know, vertices as the elements of P and the edges are the covering relations, okay. So, the edges of P are the covering relations, that is, you know, when you have, uh, when you have uh, and elements in between, right, you don't, so even though phi is a subset of, let's say, every set, you don't put an edge like this, because uh, there is already a set, right, uh, let's say, A, which is, comes in between uh, A, B, and uh, phi, right, so therefore, I only put this edge, and then the edge connecting this, so these two together tells me that, you know, there is, uh, there is this, uh, uh, what you call, uh, can, I know, the comparability, but uh, uh, we, it is not a covering relation. So, I will not put the additional line. Now, we also that, uh, make sure that in the Hasse diagram, when X is strictly less than Y, uh, Y is, uh, you know, marked, uh, it is marked, uh, Y is marked, uh, above X horizontally, right? So, appears horizontally in the, uh, above uh, the uh, smaller element. So, <coughs> so example, uh, here are two Hasse diagrams. So, one for the poset that we considered earlier, right? The uh, poset which contains, uh, contains uh, the 1 to 8 and uh, the divisibility. So, we saw that uh, 1 uh, divides uh, 2, 3, 5, 7, right? They are precisely the prime numbers if you observe. And then, uh, you know, 2 divides 4, right? And 2 covers 4 because there is nothing in between. 4 divides 8, 2 divides also 6, 3 divides 6, and uh, no other elements does not divide any other elements. 
So we get the complete description of the uh, faucet here in the Hasse diagram. So once you have the Hasse diagram, you know the faucet. So here is another example, right? You have x and y, and x is less than t, x is less than z, then uh, y is less than z, and y is less than u, right? t is less than w, z is less than w, t and u are less than v, right? Now, <coughs> we say that the faucet P has a zero. If uh, you can find uh, an element, uh, you know, so I, I denote by zero hat, right? So if you can find an element, uh, uh, special element, such that uh, uh, zero hat, such that x is greater than or equal to zero hat for every x, right? It means that this is a kind of minimal element, right? So if every element is less than, uh, is greater than or equal to this, then it is a zero. Similarly, uh, P is said to have a one, if you can find an element such that every other element is less than or equal to this element. Okay. So this is uh, one like that. Uh, and uh, if you have a pose P, then you can denote by uh, P hat as the new poset that you obtain by adding an additional 0 and a 1 to P. So you add uh, two elements, introduce two elements and make one as the minimum element that you know it is less than or equal to every other element and then uh, one as greater than or equal to every other element. So if you do that then you get a new poset P, P hat. So you know even if P originally had a 0 you can still add it but then you know the original 0 may not be the 0 anymore. Right? So here is an example. You start with uh, this faucet P, right? So the P is the faucet, and you can see that A is a minimal element because it is less than or equal to every other element. But there is no, uh, you know, maximum element, for example, right? Uh, I mean, I should not say maximum. There is no one here because uh, there is no element which is larger than uh, every other element. Here. On the other hand, I, if I take P hat, I am going to introduce a zero here, and also a one there. And now a is no more the zero, uh, but zero hat is, and uh, similarly one hat is a, is a one. Okay. Now, a chain uh, is a poset where any two elements are comparable. Suppose you take, uh, you know, uh, a set of elements and say that any two are comparable, right? One is less than or equal to other. For example, if you look at the natural numbers, right? Natural numbers, you know that, okay, every element can be less than or equal to the, you know, uh, the following numbers, right? So, uh, and you, you know, like you can compare any two of them. So that is a chain, right? So you can see that. So with that uh, usual uh, less than or equal to relation, the natural relation. Here is a smaller uh, subset, we've gone to 3, 4, 5, and uh, 1 is less than or equal to 2, 2 less than or equal to 3, 3 less than or equal to 4, 4 less than or equal to 5. And because uh, you can see that, you know, every element is comparable because of the, uh, uh, because of the structure. And uh, the length of uh, a chain is uh, the number of uh, vertices minus 1, the cardinality of C minus 1. So the length of this chain is basically uh, 5 minus 1, which is 4. Okay. So the length is 4. Okay. <clears throat> so you can think of many other chains. It's very easy to see. Now, if every uh, maximal chain in a poset, okay, so for, you know, once you have, uh, you know, uh, once you have defined the chain as a poset. Uh, a suppose that uh, isomorphic to a chain is also uh, called a chain, right? In the in the poset. So if every maximal chain uh, in a poset P has the same length n, then we say P is a graded uh, poset with rank n. Okay. So if you look at this uh, example, so we looked at this example, right? So if you look at uh, you know the chains, maximal chains here, okay. 
So, so what is a chain? So basically, like you know, so a b is a chain, right? Because a less than or equal to a comma b, like so not a b. So a a b is a chain. But this is not a maximal chain because you know I can extend the chain below and above. So there is this uh, maximal, right? This chain. So the length of the chain is three here, right? Now. If you if you look through this, you can verify that every maximal chain has the same length. So every maximal chain has length three. So in such a case, we will say that okay, this uh, this uh, poset is graded, and uh, its rank is uh, n. In this case, it is three, right? So the length of the chain is three. So therefore, the rank is three. Okay. Now. You can take the elements and then look at the you know the length of the chains from the smallest minimum elements, and then you can see that okay if the if the length from the minimum element is whatever uh, i, then I can say that that is the rank of the element. Okay, so I will say that this is uh, one, this is uh, two, and this is three. So the elements in this uh, level you can verify that are all having rank two. Here all of them having rank one, and here this is zero, and this is three. So this is uh, you know uh, this uh, you know intuitively tells you why this is uh, graded of a you know given rank. Now uh, as an exercise, you show that uh, you know B n for any arbitrary n is also graded of uh, rank n. Okay. <coughs> now. Suppose uh, you have a poset P which is graded with rank n, and uh, suppose P subscript i small p i denote the number of elements of rank i, uh, which is you know rank i is the distance from the minimum element. Then summation i is equal to zero to n p i x raised to i is called the rank generating function of the poset. Okay, so. Uh, the rank generating function is summation pi uh, x raised to i. So, for example, in this case, you have uh, you know p zero is one, uh, right? So, what is p zero? This that. Yeah. So, p zero is one. This is small p. Yeah. P0 is equal to 1, then P1 is equal to 3, P2 is equal to 3, and P3 equal to 1, right? So you have this, and then uh, you know this, uh, uh, you know, you can now write a summation, you know, this values, and then you will okay, the rank generating. Okay, so we will we'll not look at uh, the rank generating function at the moment. Uh, we will only uh, look at uh, it later uh, when we look at generating functions. Okay, so I think. Uh, okay. Now. Now, uh, an anti chain or a clutter, uh, anti chain or a clutter uh, is a sub poset where uh, no two elements are compared. Okay. So, if you have uh, you know a subset where no two elements are comparable, for example, if you take uh, this poset and if you take B and C, right, B and C are not comparable, right. Similarly, B and E are also not comparable. So the subset b comma uh, e or b comma c are uh, clutters or uh, anti chains. So you can find the several uh, of these in these examples, right? For example, two, three, five, and seven uh, form uh, an anti chain, right? Five and uh, four form an anti chain, seven and uh, eight form an anti chain, right? So these things uh, are anti chains. Okay, now 
when you have uh, two elements x and y in a poset p okay and say a third element uh, w is said to be an upper bound for x and y So an element w uh, is an upper bound for elements x and y if uh, w is greater than or equal to x and w is greater than or equal to y okay so x and y themselves may not have any relation between them there could be also but uh, then an upper bound is uh, you know is an element which is greater than or equal to both of these elements right so in this uh, example again right uh, for example, in, in the poset P, for example, D, right? The element D is greater than or equal to B and C. So B and C of D as an upper bound. Now, an upper bound uh, is called a least upper bound. Okay, so X and Y are elements uh, for which Z is an upper bound. So Z is a least upper bound. If for every upper bound, let's say W of X and Y, of course, uh, W is greater than or equal to Z. So Z is the, it's an upper bound, but it is, there is no smaller uh, upper bound for uh, X and Y. So then it's a least upper bound. So similarly, you can define the notion of greatest lower bound. Okay. And if a least upper bound uh, of X and Y exists, then it is unique. So why uh, you think about it and prove it? It's easy to see, but uh, you know try to argue it. So if a least upper bound of x and y exists, it is unique, and this uh, is denoted usually by x uh, join v, where x uh, disjunction uh, v is uh, read as x join v. And similarly, the greatest lower bound uh, again, if x is unique and it is denoted by x uh, meet v or x uh, conjunction v so we read it as x meet v uh, x meet y and uh, here we read it as x uh, join y okay now a poset where every uh, pair of elements has a least upper bound and a greater lower bound it is called a lattice again you know there is you know there is a whole branch called lattice theory but we will not uh, look at uh, much of lattices just to in case of, of some exercise or something mentions lattice i just want you to know that uh, uh, what is it so that is the only reason uh, we defined uh, lattice and it has very nice properties uh, you know uh, maybe in some of the exercises you can see uh, why it is uh, nice Now show that uh, every finite lattice has a zero and a one. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, every pair of elements has a least upper bound and greater least upper bound. That uh, says that it is a lattice, but if it is also finite, then there is a unique minimum element and a maximum element. So that is why uh, it's, it's a nice formula. Okay, I think that is uh, all about our uh, introduction to partial objects. Now, uh, we will, uh, oh, maybe, maybe uh, a couple of more, uh, couple of more uh, uh, slides. Okay, so uh, if you, if you have two uh, posets P and Q, and the Cartesian product of uh, P and Q uh, is, uh, you know, defined over the Cartesian product of the sets P and Q. A set of all xy is such that x belongs to p and y belongs to q such that the ordered couple x comma y is less than or equal to x dash y dash in uh, the product p cross q uh, if and only if x is less than or equal to x dash in p and y is less than or equal to y dash in q okay. so the uh, cartesian product of the four sets is defined this way right it's also called direct product in some uh, uh, textbooks so the uh, Cartesian product of the two posets P and Q is precisely defined over the Cartesian product of the sets P and Q, such that uh, uh, the tuple XY is less than or equal to the tuple uh, X dash Y dash, if and only if X is less than or equal to X dash in P and Y is less than or equal to Y dash in Q. 
So here is the pictorial representation or has a diagrammatic representation of the product. So you know, so you have this uh, faucet and you have this faucet. You take the product of these two is obtained by uh, replacing, for example, you know, every copy, uh, every vertex uh, of the first faucet with a copy of the second faucet. Right. So I replace every vertex with a copy of the second faucet. And whenever uh, there is, you know, a relation here, now the corresponding elements of this two uh, posets are joined in a relation okay the same relation that we are having here and similarly right here so so we get the product now from this definition right if you look at this definition you can see that the product uh, it does not depend on which way you are going to do the uh, substitution. You can instead you can take these vertices and substitute copies of this. So what happens is the Hasse diagram looks very different from the Hasse diagram that we got here, but the the posets are indeed isomorphic. So uh, try to uh, try to work out some examples and uh, convince yourself that if you replace uh, you know in a different way, you will get a different uh, structure of the Hasse diagram. But the posets are indeed uh, isomorphic. So take it as homework, take some small example and work out, take the product and see that uh, they are uh, they are isomorphic uh, if even if you take uh, p cross q or q cross p. Okay, a homework. Uh, consider the chain of length two, I mean length one, which is two element chain, right? So just one and two, okay. So one is uh, the smallest element, two is the largest element. So one, two forms a chain. So the chain of length uh, one or uh, the chain of two elements uh, uh, is denoted C. Now show that uh, the poset that we looked at B n, right, uh, is isomorphic to the n-fold product of C with itself. That is. You take this poset, multiply it with itself n times, and then you will get uh, a poset, and that poset is isomorphic to Pn. Okay. So, this is the subset poset with the containment relation for the power set of n element set, right? So, that is Bn. So, uh, this is what, right? So, product of C with itself n times is isomorphic to Bn. So, this is a very nice homer. Uh, uh, and uh, with that, uh, uh, yeah, so with that, we, we finish the introduction to the posets and uh, try to look at a few more examples from the textbook and then, uh, then uh, convince yourself that you are comfortable with the notion of posets and you know the related concepts that we have defined here. Okay.